Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest, audiobook uploads. Preface to The Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian Translated by Howard Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Preface For the few ascertained facts in the life of the greatest prose satirist and the most brilliant wit of Greek and Latin antiquity, we are indebted, almost wholly, to scattered and incidental allusions in his own various writings. Like his immediate predecessor, Menippus the satirist, the illustrious Neoplatonist Porphyry in the third, and the orator Libanius in the fourth century, Lucian was Syrian by birth. He was born at Samosata. Its heap of ruins still retains the old name almost unchanged. On the Euphrates, not far distant from Edessa, and the chief city of the district of Comagene, in the extreme northeast of Syria, about the year 120 A.D. Tradition protracts the term of his existence to the age of ninety, or even one hundred years. He thus lived through the reigns of Hadrian, the two Antonines, and Commodus, and, at all events, the earlier parts of the reign of Severus, altogether the happiest period of the Roman Empire, and one of the most interesting ages in the world's history. Of his earlier life, the brief record supplied in his incomplete autobiographical sketch, The Dream, so often has been repeated that it is not necessary to do more than to refer to it here. It is enough briefly to repeat that the deliberations of a family council determined his parents, who were in poor circumstances, to apprentice him at the age of fifteen to his maternal uncle, a statuary, for whose art he had shown some boyish inclination, that by a fortunate accident, fortunate at least for the world of literary, if not of plastic, art, the breaking of a piece of marble, he was induced to run away from his master, in resentment at a severe flogging, and to transfer his allegiance to literature, Paideia, or rather to prepare himself, in the first instance, by a severe course of training, for the profession of a rhetor, in modern phrase a public speaker, which eventually led him to embrace the career of philosophy and letters. At this very early stage his memoir, unhappily, comes to an end, and we are left to incidental remarks in his more considerable productions. His experiences for some years lay in the hard school of poverty and neglect. In search of employment, or rather, to master the rudiments of his profession, the young Lucian wandered through the cities of the southwestern region of the Lesser Asia, the celebrated and highly cultured Ionia, gradually getting rid of his provincial manner and dialect, but still conspicuous by his Syrian, or, as he calls it, Assyrian, and un-Greek style of dress. In his twentieth year he arrived in Greece, and made his first acquaintance with the Platonic philosopher Nigrinus, who gives the title to one of his dialogues. He next settled in the Syrian capital, Antioch, where he practiced at the bar, and acquired considerable reputation as a pleader. But the chicanery and frauds of the interpreters of the laws soon caused him to abandon that pursuit. The skill thus gained he turned to lucrative account as travelling disputant, sophistus, as it was termed, a popular and profitable calling which was as common in the philosophic Hellenic and Roman world in the second century A.D. as it was in the scholastic Europe of the Middle Ages. In that capacity he traversed Syria and Egypt. Soon afterwards he visited Rome, in the year 150, among other reasons, to consult an oculist, and in his negriness, the literary result of his visit, 
he stigmatizes the prevailing corruptions and laborious trifling of the literary as well as the fashionable society of the capital. After a stay of two years in Italy, he proceeded to southern Gaul, at that time, and long previously, celebrated for its schools of rhetoric. In Gaul he continued his profession of public lecturer for some ten years, his residence in that country being interrupted only by a visit to Olympia. During this period, however, he composed many of his published rhetorical pieces. Having now secured an independent income, at the age of forty, Lucian set out again on his travels, and made a journey through Macedonia and Thessaly, on his way to his Syrian home. His stay at Samosata was only temporary, and inducing his surviving family to remove to Athens, in the next year he himself followed them to the literary metropolis, which to him, as to every Greek or Philhellenist, doubtless was an object of supreme intellectual curiosity. It was on his journey to Athens that he had the interview with the Paphlagonian prophet Alexander, which gave birth to his satire of that name. The contempt openly exhibited by him for that eminent miracle worker had almost, as he assures us, cost him his life for the exasperated Alexander had secretly instructed the crew of the vessel, which he had insidiously placed at his visitor's disposal, to make away with their charge, a conspiracy frustrated only by the interposition of the relenting captain. Thus saved from a premature and inglorious end, he proceeded on his journey to Athens, accompanied by that extraordinary adventurer Peregrinus, or Peregrinus Proteus, whose fiery immolation of himself, like that of another Hercules Furens, before the assembled multitude at Olympia, witnessed by Lucian in the year 165, forms the principal subject of the Peregrinus. At Athens, Lucian seems, for there is no positive evidence, to have taken up his fixed abode for the greater part of his remaining life occupying himself, as may safely be conjectured, in the highest philosophical and literary studies, and in the enjoyment of the friendship of such exceptional philosophers as Celsus, the famous Platonist critic of nascent Christianity. In his true account, known to us only through the reply of Origen, published fifty years later, of the Stoic Sostratus and the Eclectic Demonax, his sketch of the career of the last, a meritorious ethical teacher, forms one of the not rare proofs of his esteem for real goodness. During this period appeared his masterpieces, his principal theological, philosophical, and ethical dialogues, when that consummate skill in the management of the marvellous Attic dialect had been attained, which rivals the style of the best masters and which, as the acquisition of a foreigner, excites the admiration of all his editors and critics. Perhaps the only other equally remarkable instance of such kind of excellence is that of the African Terence. When about the age of seventy, impelled, it would seem, by imminent poverty, for authors then, even of the highest reputation, fell very far short of obtaining from the soci of the day the immense pecuniary profits now often secured by ephemeral writers. Lucian once more resumed his old occupation of rhetor or sophist, and produced some of those declamatory essays which appear among his published works. At a fortunate moment, he found relief from his pecuniary difficulties in an official income derived from his appointment to the registrarship or clerkship of the law courts of the Egyptian capital, the presentation to which office has variously been assigned to Marcus Aurelius, Commodus, and Severus. Chronology seems, on the whole, to support the claims of the last prince, who became emperor in 193, to the honour of saving from destitution the greatest literary ornament of the century. To clear himself from the charge of teaching one thing, 
in his satire on hired dependence and practising another by way of supplement to that essay he published his apology from it incidentally we learn that he derived a large salary from his legal post he alleges the forcible argument that as the imperial master of the roman legions himself not to mention numerous less exalted personages by no means refused the richest emoluments of office he the starving critic could scarcely be blamed for following in a very humble fashion and at a very long interval that elevated example for the most part his official duties at alexandria he devolved upon a deputy so that his learned leisure was little disturbed at athens where as already stated he died at an advanced age but at what date is quite uncertain such are the somewhat meagre facts collected from his writings to these his earlier biographers or critics led by the lexicographer suidas have been pleased to make some sensational and apocryphal additions suidas of whom nothing is known except that he belongs to a very late date in byzantine literary history having probably in mind the story of the tragic end of the infidel euripides assures his readers that the blasphemer found a well-merited end in having been torn to pieces by wild dogs and not content with so unique a termination to his earthly career adds as to his posthumous existence in the future with satan he will have his portion in eternal fire another equally discreet authority of the sixteenth century raphael maffei or volateranus as he is called from his birthplace averse that he was a malicious apostate from christianity attributing to him the bon mot that he had gained nothing from his old creed but change of name lucianus in place of lucius or lucinus to these and similar mendacious assertions erasmus replies they attach to him the name of blasphemer that is evil speaker but they who did so one may sure were those whose festering sores he had probed to his bitter and persistent satirical assaults upon the established religion and upon the contending sects of so-called philosophy we may be sure not a few ephemeral replies appeared but no notices of them have come down to us while however the last echoes of pagan sacerdotal or sectarian animosity excited by his exposures died away at the establishment of christianity orthodox zeal on the other side even still sometimes regards him as the declared enemy of the christian faith the hostility of the earlier christian authorities had been aroused in particular by two very famous dialogues the peregrinus and the philopatris the patriot as for the latter it has been proved beyond reasonable doubt to have been the production of a much later writer bearing the same name as the reputed author while as for the former the chief offence originated in a mistaken reading or interpretation of the text where allusion is made to the founder of christianity in fact the brief allusions of the greek satirist to the new faith seems to discover less hostility than is displayed in his ridicule of the rival oriental creeds of the established religion itself or of the popular systems of philosophy and ethics if lucian has been thus vilified by the ignorance or malice of critics of early days on the other hand from the first moment of his resurrection at the restoration of learning from the first appearance of the editio princeps in fourteen ninety six he received an enthusiastic recognition of his rare merits from the best scholars of the time among them towers conspicuously the illustrious erasmus one of the earliest translators fifteen fourteen in conjunction with sir thomas more of the great masters of ridicule whom he himself so admirably imitates in his encomium morio praise of folly 
and not altogether so happily in his colloquies citing the well-known verse of the latin satirist poet omne tulit punctum qui miscuit utile dulci he protests no one if not lucian has succeeded in illustrating this truth he has imitated the raillery without copying the wantonness of the old comedy gracious heaven deum immortalem is his strong expletive of admiration with what sly humour with what grace and elegance he touches everything with what power of sarcasm he holds up every folly to ridicule how he seasons everything with his wonderful wit touching no absurdity that he does not cover with some irony or satire such grace continues erasmus echoing the dictum of archbishop clotius dominates in his style there is so much felicity of invention so much elegance in his wit such pungency in his more serious assaults he so tickles with his allusions so mingles the grave with the gay in such a way does he enunciate truth with a smile so admirably does he picture the manners the characters the pursuits of men as it were with a painter's pencil in such a manner does he display things which we cannot only read but actually see that whether one regards entertainment or utility and instruction there is no comedy no satire that has a right to be put in competition with his dialogues at the beginning of the sixteenth century at least this high eulogy was scarcely an exaggeration among the dialogues translated into latin by erasmus it is interesting to note are the timon and the alexander by moore who as an ecclesiastical zealot and as lord chancellor so soon forgot the spirit of his author and the principles of his own utopia the menippus the philosudes the lover of lies and the tyrannicide even melanchthon the associate of luther in the reformation struggle in germany assisted in the work of annotating the great sceptic fifteen twenty seven rabelais although there is no evidence that he took part in illustrating so congenial a mind must have been greatly indebted to him early in the next century sixteen fifteen his most considerable french editor bourdelot enthusiastically maintains that in proportion as the influence of lucian's writings was diffused the love of knowledge and virtue increased which still resides in the hearts of a few and goes so far as to affirm that by such influence the culture and even civilization of the philosopher's native country perceptibly benefited in the succeeding age a dutch critic hoogstraten believes him to have been not only the greatest genius of his own age but even of all antiquity these high eulogiums for the most part have been repeated by later critics to the days of Hemsterhaus and Wrights, whose judicious settlement of the text, and criticism and summary of the labours of preceding editors and annotators, respectively, first made to the world a worthy presentation of his genuine and attributed productions, and by competent judges of our own time. The English historian of great literature, J. W. Donaldson, holds that his merits can scarcely be overestimated and considering him with reference to his own age and to the literature of greece justly adds the learned historian a position of the utmost importance must be assigned to him both in regard to the systems of religion and of philosophy to which he gave the death-blow and in respect to the cultivation of a purer greek style which he vainly taught and exemplified during the sixteenth century sixty-five editions in greek or latin in the seventeenth twenty-two in the eighteenth forty-four besides translations bore ample witness to the estimation in which he was held by the learned world in england the first edition of him and that only in part did not appear till sixteen seventy seven 
the first version in part in 1634. No English translation of any pretension appeared till that of Carr, 1775 to 1798, a spirited but extremely free presentation of him, which was followed by that of Franklin, Professor of Greek at Cambridge, 1780, and of Took, 1820. Franklin's, although not very faithful or accurate, being altogether the most valuable of the three chief English presentations of Lucian. Of French translations, Talbot's, 1857, has the greatest repute. Of German versions, that of Wieland, the well-known poet and romanticist, 1788, is easily first and indeed it is generally held to be entitled to the foremost place among all attempts at a modern representation of the greek wit lucian is almost encyclopedic in the extent and rarity of his productions critic moralist philosopher politician poet romancist litterateur of the eighty-four separate writings attributed to him and published in the editions of his works not a few find an undeserved place there some pieces of inferior merit are the production of his earlier rhetorical period and show sufficiently evident traces of the stilted style characteristic of the fashionable declamatory essay as well in matter as in manner of his undoubted productions the shorter pieces dialogues of the gods of the sea gods and of the dead by reason of their popular subject matter and peculiar graces of style have always been most generally read his more considerable masterpieces are zeus the tragedian the sale of lives the timon the ferry boat the twice accused the fisherman the fugitives the banquet the convicted zeus the Convention of the Gods, the Charon, the Icaromenippus, the True History, the Prometheus, the Philosudes, How History Ought to be Written, the first attempt at a philosophy of history, but not of sustained merit throughout, the Peregrinus, on Sacrifices, on Mourning, and the Alexander. In the Greek anthology, twenty epigrams are ascribed to a writer bearing the name of Lucian. Whether the composition of the Lucian or not, they are by no means unworthy of his genius, and they are among the best in the whole extensive collection. It is his theological dialogues that have most contributed to his fame. The inimitable Hellenic arts of architecture and of sculpture which adorned disguised and in some measure served to redeem the character of the religion of zeus or jupiter had long shown symptoms of decay the outward and visible sign of a corresponding coolness in the religious feeling of the upper classes but the religion of homer and hesiod still kept fast hold of the affections of the body of the peoples as it continued to do in fact throughout the country districts long after the state recognition of christianity while the great majority of the educated or influential sections of society regarded it as a useful means of retaining the masses in subjection to undermine this imposing structure of mingled fraud and imposture the absurdities the follies and the hypocrisies of its various adherents lucian especially devoted his almost unrivalled powers of wit and sarcasm and if ridicule could inflict a mortal wound he might have been well satisfied with his brilliant efforts but reflection on the history of the past must sometimes have inspired him with some misgiving or even despair for he was far from having been the first to expose the character of the orthodox theology in the drama the most popular form of literature in hellas in tragedy euripides of the school of socrates had in the latter half of the fourth century given expression to the more rational belief of the best educated minds of the time in comedy the conservative aristophanes in his inimitable dramas whether purposely or not 
had held up to the most open and undisguised contempt the most sacred objects of the national and popular worship in the two next centuries scepticism was rampant in the lighter forms of literature the mimes parodies of sophron of syracuse and the bitter satires siloi as they were termed of timon of Phlius, a disciple of pyrrho whose name has given a synonym for the extremist scepticism held up to derision the occupants of the national pantheon such rationalistic writers too as euhemerus author of the sacred inscriptions palifatus author of the incredible legends and in particular menippus were direct predecessors of the satirist of samosata but these more popular writers were not the only assailants of the pagan pantheon and it is enough merely to mention the names of anaxagoras xenophanes democritus zeno the founder of the stoic school antisthenes the founder of the most practical satirists the cynics and above all epicurus to recall their wide divergences from and sometimes direct assaults on the olympian theology to lucian however as to voltaire in the last century was reserved in a very special degree the work of popularizing and bringing within the reach of the most ordinary intelligence the various labors of his predecessors of his models in the dialogue form of writing plato and xenophon are most commonly quoted but the eloquent founder of the academy and the author of the oikonomicus rather improved than originated it sophron of syracuse and zeno of elia in italy had already brought it into use in the following century antisthenes also employed it as for the ethical character of lucian if we may trust to his own representation of himself it deserves high praise in the dream among the superior advantages offered by paideia he gives prominent place to the virtues of justice mildness and reasonableness in his revived philosophers he declares himself to be a hater of falsehood of imposture of arrogance of pride a lover of truth of beauty of sincerity and all things lovely he abandoned the profession of the law from disgust for its iniquity or for the fraudulent methods of its practisers he engages as he declares in the war against falsehood quite conscious that he is fighting a desperate battle that the vast majority are against him in his biography of his friend demonax his appreciation of that superior cynic exhibits him as a sympathetic admirer of true worth in one department of morals on the assumption of his having been the author of the scandalous erotes loves he has been made the subject of undeserved censure for its tedious dullness and its frigid and sophisticated tone alike foreign to lucian's manner prove it to be spurious it has been sometimes objected to lucian's philosophical claims that he made no attempt to build anew upon the ruins of the religious system overthrown by him but in the first place systems of faith or morals already abounded at nauseam and to have erected another system of philosophy would have been only to add to the existing confusion the work immediately and urgently needed was that of complete destruction and the clearing of the ground for the future dissemination of higher and nobler ideas this he did at all events as far as religionism and metaphysical shams were concerned with the persistent zeal of a sincere reformer in the second place if the charge be a substantial one he shares the blame with almost every destructive critic of after ages whose opportunities for establishing better faiths have been superior to his the charge to which he is more justly open and it is the only grave fault perhaps in his writings is indiscrimination in his assaults on the philosophies of the day 
his apparently contemptuous treatment in particular of pythagoreanism the parents of platonism and the philosophical school which was most productive of examples of the higher virtues as well as of intellectual ability deserves censure in his sale of lives in the revived philosophers and in one of the dialogues of the dead in particular he seems to have yielded to the temptation a sort of temptation to which great wits have always been liable of utilizing matter so promising as the ridiculous fables which the enemies of pythagoreanism abundantly supplied that among the self-styled followers of pythagoras were to be found some pretenders and not a few extravagant expositors of his teaching as such are found in all societies or sects is sufficiently probable but to hold up indiscriminately to ridicule what was in the main a meritorious system of ethical philosophy that certainly did not become the character of a just critic he lived indeed before the appearance of the school of new or newer platonism whose founders plotinus ammonius and porphyry the most erudite of all the later greek scholars belong to the following century extravagant as may have been some of their speculations the new platonists by their noble if hopelessly futile attempts to reform and spiritualize the established religion and by their noble protests against the gross practical materialism of life have deserved equally with the early christians among the various contending sects of religion or philosophy very high esteem had he witnessed their self-denying lives and been acquainted with their exalted ideas and aspirations we may with some confidence believe that he would have done justice to their real merits as distinguished from the errors of judgment which lay on the surface and which were the inevitable outcome of the scientific defects of the age the present volume includes what may be termed the principal theological dialogues in the spelling of greek names in the transitional and unsettled state of greek orthography in this country any attempt to adopt a more natural method must necessarily be a compromise hence the present version is open to the charge of some orthographical inconsistency as for the translation itself the method adopted has been to adhere as closely to the original as essential differences of idiom allow to represent lucian's peculiar graces of style no translator can reasonably aspire the versions entire or partial which have appeared up to this time however spirited they may be and the german wieland surpasses all his rivals in this respect in whose hands as lehmann expresses it all lucian lives and breathes for the most part are not distinguished by any very strict fidelity to their original the text followed is that of the great work of hemsterhaus and wrights in lehmann's edition which has been compared with the alternative readings adopted by jacobins end of preface recording by phone Dialogue One of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucien, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue One: Prometheus obtains his release from Zeus by a prophecy. Zeus, read by Aaron White. Prometheus. Read by Owen Cook. Set me free, O Zeus, for I have already endured dreadful sufferings. Set you free, say you. You, who ought to have heavier fetters, and all Caucasus heaped on your head, and not only your liver gnawed by sixteen vultures, but also your eyes scooped out, in return for your fashioning such animals as men and for stealing my fire and fabricating women as for the tricks you put upon me in your distribution of the flesh meats in offering me bones wrapped up in fat 
and reserving the better portion of the pieces for yourself. Why need I speak? Have I then not paid enough penalty, nailed for such a long period of time to Caucasus, supporting that most cursed of winged creatures, the vulture, with my liver? Not an infinitesimal part that of what you ought to suffer. Yet you shall not release me without recompense, but I will impart something to you, Zeus, exceedingly important. You are for outwitting me, Prometheus. And what advantage should I gain? For you will not be ignorant hereafter of the whereabouts of Caucasus, neither will you be in want of chains, should I be caught playing you any trick. Say first what sort of equivalent you will pay of so much importance to us. If I tell you for what purpose you are now on your travels, shall I have credit with you when I prophesy about the rest? Of course. You are off to Thetis, to an intrigue with her. That, indeed, you have correct knowledge of. But what, then, after that? For you seem to have some inkling of the truth. Don't have anything to do with the Nereid, Zeus. For if she should be pregnant by you, her progeny will treat you exactly as you too treated. This do you assert, that I shall be expelled from my kingdom. Heaven forbid, Zeus. Intercourse with her, however, threatens something of the kind. Goodbye to Thetis, then. And as for you, for these timely warnings, Hephaestus shall set you free. End of Dialogue 1 Dialogue 2 of Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 2 Zeus Threatens to Put Eros in Fetters Eros and Zeus Zeus, read by Scotty Smith Eros, read by Thomas Peter Well, if I have really done wrong at all, Zeus, pardon me, for I am but an infant, and still without sense. You, an infant? You the Eros, who are far older than Iapetus. Because you have not grown a beard and don't show grey hairs, do you really claim on that account to be considered an infant, when, in fact, you are an old scamp? But what great injury have I, the old scamp, as you call me, done you, that you intend putting me in irons? Consider, cursed rascal, whether they are trifling injuries you have done me, you who make such sport of me that there is nothing which you have not turned me into. Satyr, bull, gold, swan, eagle. But not any one of them have you made to be in love with me at all. Nor have I perceived that, for anything that depends upon you, I have been agreeable to any woman. But I am obliged to have recourse to juggling tricks against them, and to conceal my proper self, well, they are really in love with the bull or swan, and, if they have but a glimpse of me, they die of fear. Naturally enough, Zeus, for being mortal women, they can't endure the sight of your person. How is it, then, that Brancus and Hyacinthus love Apollo? But even from him the beauty Daphne fled away, for all his flowing locks and beardless chin. If you wish to be loved... Don't shake your ages, and don't take your thunderbolt with you, but make yourself as agreeable as you can, letting down your locks on both sides of your face, and tying them up again under your coronet. Wear a fine purple dress, put on golden sandals, step along keeping time to the sounds of the pipe and cymbals, and you will see that more women will follow you than all the maenads of Bacchus. Get away with you. I would not take the offer of being loved on condition of becoming such a figure. Then, Zeus, don't wish to love either. That, at all events, is an easy matter. Not so. But I do wish to love, and to enjoy their society in a lex vexatious fashion. 
Upon this, and this condition alone, I let you go. End of Dialogue 2《Dialogue Three of the Dialogues of the Gods》by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue Three. Zeus orders Hermes to slay Argus, and to conduct Io to Egypt. Hermes, read by Stephan. Zeus, read by Scotty Smith. Hermes, do you know the daughter of Inachus, the famous beauty? Yes, you mean the far-famed Io. She is no longer a girl, but a heifer. Prodigious that! But how was she transformed? Hera, in a fit of jealousy, metamorphosed her. And not only that, but she has also contrived another sort of new mischief against the unfortunate girl. She has appointed a certain cowkeeper with eyes all over him, who tends the heifer with sleepless care. What must I do, then? Fly down to Nemea. It's somewhere there that Argus tends his charge, and kill him off. But as for Io, bring her away by sea to Egypt, and transform her into Isis, and, for the future, let her be a divinity to the people of the country, and let her raise the Nile and send favorable winds, and be the patron saint of sailors. End of Dialogue 3 Dialogue 4 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian Translated by Howard Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Dialogue 4 Zeus instructs Ganymedes as to the nature of his duties in heaven. Zeus, read by Scotty Smith. Ganymedes, read by Owen Cook. Come, Ganymede, for we have arrived at the proper place. Kiss me now, that you may know that I have no longer crooked beak, nor sharp talons, nor wings such as I appeared to you under the semblance of a bird. Were you not an eagle but just now, fellow? And did you not pounce down and carry me off from the midst of my flock? How then have those feathers fallen off from you entirely? And you have come out now in quite a different character. But, my dear boy, you see neither a man nor an eagle. But it is I here, the king of all the gods, who have metamorphosed myself at the right moment. How? Oh. What, are you the great Pan? Then how haven't you a syrinx, or horns, and hairy legs? <laughs> Why, do you take him to be the only divinity? Yes, and we sacrifice to him an uncastrated he-goat, bringing him to the grotto where the god stands. But as for you, you seem to me to be some kidnapping slave-dealer or other. Tell me, have you never heard the name of Zeus, nor seen on Gargarus an altar to the rain-sender and thunderer and lightninger? Do you say, fine sir, that you are quite the same who but lately poured down on us that quantity of hail, who are said to live up above and make such a din, to whom my father sacrificed a ram? Then how have I wronged you that you have carried me off, O king of the gods? Already, I doubt, will the wolves be falling upon my unprotected sheep and tearing them to pieces? What? Have you, who have been made immortal, and who are to live with us here, still a regard for your sheep? How do you say? Then will you not this very day take me down home to Ida? By no means. 
In that case, I should have changed from a god into an eagle to no purpose. My father, then, will certainly be looking for me, and be angry at not finding me, and then I shall be whipped by and by for having left my flock. Why, where will he see you? Don't keep me, please, for I am already longing to see him. And if you will take me back, I promise you another ram shall be sacrificed by him as my ransom. We have the three-year-old one, that fine one who leads the flock to pasture. How simple and innocent is the child, a child yet all over, truly. But, my dear Ganymede, bid farewell to all those things and forget them, your flock and Ida, and you from this place for you are now enrolled among the celestials, will do many services both to your father and to your country, and, instead of cheese and milk, you will eat ambrosia and drink nectar. This latter, indeed, you shall yourself pour out and offer to the rest of us. But what is more than all, you will no longer be mortal, but shall become immortal, and I will make your star shine very bright, and, in a word, you shall be happy. And if I want to play, who will play with me? On Ida there were many of us, playmates of the same age. Here, too, you have a playmate. Eros there, and any number of knuckle-bones. Only cheer up and be bright, and don't hanker after any of the things down below there. In what? way please can i be of use to you must i look after flocks and herds here too no but you shall pour wine into the goblet and you shall be placed in charge of the nectar and shall have the care of the banqueting hall that's no hard matter for i know how to pour in milk and to pass about the milk bowl there again he is thinking of his milk and fancies that he will have to wait upon mortals but this is heaven here, and we drink, as I told you, the celestial nectar. Is it sweeter than milk, Zeus? You shall know for yourself shortly, and when you have once tasted it, you will not again have any longing for your milk. But where shall I sleep at night, with my playfellow Eros? No. I carried you off on this account, that we might sleep together. Why, could you not sleep alone? But is it pleasanter to you to sleep with me? Yes, with such a one as you, Ganymede, so handsome as you are. Why, how will handsome looks give you pleasure in respect to sleep? They have a certain sweet charm, and bring it on more softly. Yet my father used to be annoyed with me when I slept in the same bed with him, and used to tell me in the morning how I had taken away his sleep by my restlessness and kicking and talking in my sleep, for which reason he would generally send me to bed with my mother. If it was on that account, as you say, that you carried me off, it is high time for you to put me down on earth again, or you will be annoyed by being kept awake, for I shall disturb you by my continual tossing about." In doing that very thing, you will most please me, since I shall keep awake with you in frequent kisses and embraces. You would have to see to that yourself. As for me, while you are kissing me, I shall lull myself to sleep. We shall know what is to be done then. But now take him away, Hermes, and when he has quaffed immortality, bring him to us to be our cup-bearer, having, first of all, instructed him how he is to hand his cup. End of Dialogue 4 Dialogue 5 of Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian Translated by Howard Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Dialogue 5. Hera upbraids Zeus with his love for Ganymedes. Hera and Zeus. Hera, read by phone. Zeus, read by Scotty Smith. 
ever since zeus you carried off that phrygian youth from ida and brought him up here you pay me less attention what are you really jealous here already about so simple and very innocent an affair as that i thought you were hard only upon the women who might happen to be intimate with me your conduct not even in those matters is proper or becoming to yourself you the liege lord of all the gods to desert me your lawful wedded wife and go down to earth to intrigue in the shape of gold or of a satyr or of a bull but at least those females of yours remain on earth while this youth from ida you snatched up and flew off with o oh, most respectable of gods actually lives with us put over my head a cup-bearer to be sure in name were you ever so desperately at a loss for butlers and have hebe and hephaestus really become worn out in the service and you you will not take the cup from him otherwise than first kissing him in the sight of us all and a kiss is sweeter to you than nectar and on that account you are constantly asking to drink without even being thirsty when too after just tasting it you hand back the cup to him and after he has drunk you receive it from him again you quaff off the remainder from the place where the boy has drunk from and where he has applied his lips that you may drink and kiss at one and the same moment nay but just now you the king and father of the universe laid aside aegis and thunderbolt and sat down to a game of knuckle-bones with him with all that big beard you have grown all these fine doings i see so don't suppose you are unobserved and what dreadful crime is it here to kiss so fair a youth between cups and to derive pleasure from both the kisses and the nectar if believe me i were to allow him to kiss you once even you would never again blame me for thinking the kiss preferable to the nectar this is the talk of a pederast but for my part may i never be so mad as to offer my lips to this soft phrygian boy so completely effeminated as he is do not upbraid me most admirable of goddesses with loves of this sort for this youth effeminate a foreigner soft and girlish as he is is more agreeable to me and more desirable than <sighs> but i have no wish to say it not to further provoke you would that you would even marry him for my own sake don't forget however how offensively you insult me in your cups on account of this male hebe of yours not so but that son of yours hephaestus must needs act as butler with his limping gait coming straight from his forge still covered all over with sparks his fire tongs only just laid aside and from those fingers of his i had to receive the goblet and drawing him to me to greet him with a salute between while whom not even you his mother would kiss with any pleasure with his face completely blackened with soot the present arrangement is much more agreeable for will you say that it is not so that cup-bearer of yours certainly excellently becomes the table of the gods while ganymede must be sent down back to ida for he is clean and rosy-fingered and hands the goblet deftly and what most vexes you gives kisses more sweet than nectar yes hephaestus is lame now and his fingers are not fit to touch your cup and he is covered with soot and the sight of him turns you sick ever since ida produced that handsome youth with the flowing locks yet formerly you did not observe these things neither the sparks nor the forge turned your stomach so as to prevent your drinking from his hand you plague yourself to no purpose hera while you intensify my love for him by your jealousy well if you are annoyed at receiving the goblet from a beautiful boy 
let your son pour out your wine and as for you ganymede hand the cup only to myself and at each time kiss me twice when you offer it fool and again whenever you take it back from me what's this in tears don't be afraid if any one has any intention of annoying you he will have cause to lament End of Dialogue 5、Dialogue 6 of Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 6 Ixion makes love to Hera. Hera and Zeus. Hera read by phone. Zeus read by Scotty Smith. This Ixion, Zeus, what sort of character do you take him to be? A good kind of man, and a boon companion, for he would not associate with us had he been unworthy of our table. But he is unworthy of it, for he is an insolent fellow, so let him not live with us any longer. Of what insolence or injury has he been guilty, pray? For I ought to know too, I think. Insolence? And what else? I blush, however, to mention it. Such was his daring impertinence. Yet that is the more reason you should tell me, in proportion to the baseness of his attempt. Surely he has not attempted any one's virtue, has he? For I understand the disgraceful conduct to be something of a kind which you would shrink from telling me. On mine and no one else's has he made his assaults now for a long time past. At first I was ignorant of the reason why he kept staring fixedly at me, while he would sigh and secretly drop a tear. And whenever, after drinking, I handed the beaker to Ganymede, he would ask to drink from the very same place. And would take and kiss it between while, and put it to his eyes, and again stare at me. These actions I now began to perceive to be amorous signs. For a long time I felt ashamed to speak to you, and thought that the fellow would cease from his mad folly. But when he dared to make his advances to me in words, I left him still in tears and prostrate at my feet. And stopping my ears, not to hear even his insolent entreaties, I came away to tell you. Now, do you yourself look to it in what manner you shall punish the man? Is this the fine return the cursed villain makes to myself, even so far as to aspire to the favours of Hera? Has he become so drunk on our nectar? But we ourselves are the cause of these outrages, and are out of all measure philanthropic in making men our boon companions. They have some excuse, therefore, if, while drinking on equal terms with us, and beholding celestial beauties, and of a sort they never have seen on earth, overpowered by love, they eagerly long to enjoy them. Well, love is an intractable sort of creature. And governs not only men, but even ourselves sometimes. Of you, he is certainly very much the master, and drives and leads you captive, dragging you, as they say, by the nose, and you follow him wherever he may lead you, and he easily transforms you into whatever he wishes. And in fine, you are a mere possession and plaything of love. And now I know well why you extend your pardon to Ixion, inasmuch as you yourself had an intrigue with his wife, who presented you with that Perithous of yours. What must you be for ever bringing up to mind those little trifles, whatever sport I have gone down to earth and enjoyed? But do you know what I have in my mind about Ixion? By no means to punish him, nor to expel him from our table, for that would be an uncourteous act. And since he is in love, and, as you say, falls to tears and feels unendurable, what are you going to utter, Zeus? 
for i am afraid you too are on the point of saying something impertinent not at all but let us form a phantom out of a cloud like your very self and when the dinner party is broken up and he as is highly probable as keeping his vigils under the influence of his passion let us carry it and lay it down by his side and this way he would cease to be plagued supposing he had had what he wanted get away with you plague take him for indulging hopes beyond a station put up with it however my dear hera for what terrible harm could you get from the counterfeit figure if ixion shall have to do with a mere cloud yes but i shall be supposed to be the cloud and he will perpetrate upon me his foul purpose through the resemblance your objection is nothing to the purpose for neither will the cloud ever be hera nor will you be a cloud while ixion will only be deceived but all men are so vulgar-minded and without good taste when he goes down he will probably talk big and recount to everybody that he has enjoyed the favours of hera and shared the bed of zeus maybe he will even assert that i am in love with him and not knowing it was a cloud he was with they will believe him then if he should say anything of the kind the wretch shall be thrown into hell be bound to a wheel and carried round with it for ever and ever and shall suffer everlasting torture paying the penalty not of his love for that surely is not so dreadful a crime but of his loud boasting end of dialogue six Dialogue 7 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian. Translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 7. Hephaestus recounts to Apollo the actions of the infant prodigy Hermes. Hephaestus. Read by Owen Cook. Apollo. Read by T.J. Burns apollo have you seen maya's baby which is just born what a pretty thing it is and how it smiles on everyone and already plainly shows he is going to turn out some great treasure that a baby or a great treasure who is older than iapetus himself as far as depends on rascality <laughs> and what possible mischief could an infant just born be able to do ask poseidon whose trident he stole or ares for even from the latter he abstracted his sword from the sheath without being found out not to speak of myself whom he disarmed of all my bows and arrows the new-born brat did this who hardly keeps on his feet who is still in his long clothes you will know well enough hephaestus if only he come near you indeed he already has been near me well have you all your tools and is none of them missing all of them are safe my dear apollo all the same examine carefully by heaven i don't see my fire tongs no but you will probably see them among the infant's swaddling clothes is he so light-fingered for all the world as though he had mastered the purloining art in his mother's womb no wonder you ask for you have not heard his glib and voluble prattling he is besides quite ready to wait upon us and yesterday he challenged eros and wrestled with him and threw him somehow tripping up his feet then while he was getting praised for it he stole aphrodite's cestus as she was folding him to her breast on account of his victory and while he was laughing the sceptre of zeus also and if the thunderbolt were not a little too heavy and had a good deal of fire in it he would have filched that too the child you describe is a regular gorgon not only so but already he is a musical genius also from what can you draw your inferences to that? 
Somewhere or other he found a dead tortoise, and from it formed a musical instrument. For, having fitted in the horns, or side pieces, and joined them by a bar, he next fixed pegs and inserted a bridge beneath them. And, after stretching seven strings upon it, he set about playing a very pretty and harmonious tune, so that even I, practiced as I have long been playing the Sathara, envied him. And Maya assured us that not even his nights would he pass in heaven, but from mere busybodiness he would descend as far as Hades, to steal something from thence, I suppose. He is furnished with wings, and has made for himself a sort of staff of wonderful virtue, with which he chaperones the souls of dead men, and conducts them down to the infernal regions. I gave him that for a plaything. Then he has paid you back, your fire tongs. Well remembered. So I will march off to recover it, if, as you say, it is anywhere to be found among his cradle clothes. End of dialogue number seven. Dialogue eight of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian. Translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue eight. Hephaestus assists at the parturition of Zeus and the birth of Athena. Hephaestus and Zeus. Narrator read by phone. Hephaestus read by Kevin S. Zeus read by Owen Cook. What have I to do, Zeus? For I am come, as you ordered me, with my sharpest axe, sharp enough even though it were wanted to cut through a stone at one stroke displaying his tool well done my dear hephaestus but don't waste time but bring it down with a will and split my head in two you are trying me if i am in my right senses order pray something else whatever it is you really want done to you i desire my skull to be split open that and nothing else if you will not obey me it is not the first time you will tempt my anger well now you must come down with all your soul and strength and that without delay for i am simply dying under the pangs of labor which rack my poor brain terribly look out zeus that we don't do you some injury for the axe is sharp and not unattended with blood nor will it act the midwife for you after the fashion of Elithia. Bring it down boldly, without more ado, sir. I know what's best. Tis surely against my will, but I will down with it, however, for what's one to do when you order a thing? Starting back in alarm. What's this? A girl in armor? A mighty pain you had in your head, Zeus. With good reason, I admit, you are so short-tempered, maintaining alive in the pia mater of your brain a virgin of such proportions, and that too in a suit of armor. Was a camp, surely, not a head you have had all this while, without its being known. Why, she leaps and dances the Pyrrhic dance, and clashes her shield and brandishes her spear, and is all on fire with martial excitement. And what is more, in this short time she has become a very beautiful woman and is in her full bloom already she has a fierceness in her bluish-gray eyes to be sure but her helmet sets off that too to advantage so zeus pay me my midwife fee by betrothing her to me now at once you ask impossibilities hephaestus for she chooses to remain ever a virgin. But I, however, as far as I am concerned, offer no opposition. It's all I wanted. The rest shall be my care, and I will carry her off even now. If you find it an easy affair, do so. But I know that you are indulging a hopeless passion. End of Dialogue 8 Dialogue 9 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian. 
translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 9 Hermes refuses Poseidon admission to Zeus, and assigns as the reason the lying in of the king of gods and men with Bacchus. Poseidon and Hermes Narrator read by phone Poseidon read by Todd Hermes read by Owen Cook May one have an interview with Zeus just now, Hermes? By no means, my dear Poseidon. At all events, announce me to him. Making a forward movement. Hermes interposing himself. Don't be a nuisance, I say, for it is quite an unseasonable moment, so you could not possibly see him at present. He is not engaged with Hera, is he? No, but it is quite another sort of affair. I understand. Ganymedes is closeted with him. Not that, either. The fact is, he is rather poorly. From what cause, my dear Hermes? For this is strange news, you report. I blush to tell it such as its nature. But you need not blush to tell me, your uncle. He has but just now been brought to bed, Poseidon. Away with you. He brought to bed? By whom? Is he a hermaphrodite, without our knowing it all this time? Yet his person did not discover any symptoms of it. You are right, for the usual part did not hold the embryo. Ah, I know. He has given birth again through his headpiece, as he did to Athena. It's his head he keeps for a breeding place. No, it was in his thigh that he was pregnant with Semele's infant. Well done, the excellent parent. How productive he is all over, and in every part of his body. But who is this Semele? A lady of Thebes, one of the daughters of Cadmus. He paid her a visit, and made her enceinte. Then did he take her place in the straw, Hermes? Exactly, however strange and paradoxical it appears to you. For Hera, you know how jealous she is, secretly laid a trap for her, and persuaded her to request from Zeus that he would come to her with thunder and lightning. And when he complied, and came on with his thunderbolt, the roof of the house was all set on fire and burnt up, and poor Semele perished in the flames. And he orders me to cut open the lady's womb, and to bring up to him the still imperfect embryo of seven months. When I had done so, he cuts open his own thigh and inserts it, that it might there receive its completion. And now, exactly in the third month, he has given birth to the child, and is feeling poorly after the pangs of parturition. Where, then, is the baby now? I took it off to Nysa, and delivered it to the nymphs to bring up, after giving it the name of Dionysus. And is my brother really both father and mother of this Dionysus? So it seems, but I am now off to fetch water for his wound, and to perform the other services which are customary, just as for a lady after confinement. End of Dialogue 9。Dialogue 10 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 10 Hermes conveys to Helios the order of Zeus that he is to refrain from driving his chariot until the completion of the armor of the king of gods and men with Alcamini. Hermes, read by Stephan. Helios, read by Elsie Selwyn. Helios, you are not to drive out today, Zeus says, nor tomorrow, nor the day after, but to remain at home, and let that interval of time be one long kind of night so let the hoary unharness your horses again and do you put out your fires and repose yourself for a good long time new and strange instructions these hermes you come to give me 
but am i thought to blunder in any way on my course and to drive beyond its bounds and is it on that account he is vexed with me and determined to make the night three times the length of one day nothing of the kind nor will it be always so but he wants the night just now to be somewhat longer than usual on his own account and where is he or whence have you been dispatched with this message for me from boeotia helios from amphitryon's wife with whom he now is making love to her then is one night not enough by no means for some mighty and much victorious divinity is to be born from this intercourse that he should be turned out complete and perfect in one night is simply impossible well may he turn him out to perfection and good luck to him this sort of thing however was not the fashion in the time of chronos for we are all alone by ourselves nor did he ever sleep apart from rhea nor would he leave heaven and go to bed in thebes but day was day and night according to its proper measure was proportionate in the number of its hours and there was nothing strange or confused and interchanged and he would never have intrigued with a mortal woman but now for the sake of some wretched female everything must be turned upside down and my horses must become unmanageable from want of work and their route by remaining untrodden for three successive days almost impassable while as for men they must pass their time miserably in darkness such are the benefits they will enjoy from the amours of zeus and they will have to sit down and wait until he has accomplished this fine athlete whom you speak of under cover of prolonged darkness hold your tongue helios for fear you may get some mischief from your words now i shall be off to selene and hypnus and announce to them too the message of zeus that the former travel leisurely on her journey and that hypnus let not mortals go so that they may not know that the night has been so long end of dialogue ten dialogue eleven of the dialogues of the gods by lucian translated by howard williams this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 11 Aphrodite charges Selene with her love for Endymion, and, at the same time, laments the tyranny of her son, Eros, over herself. Aphrodite, read by Sandra Selene, read by Lian Yao what is this selene they say you do that when you are over against carrier you stop your chariot and fix all your gaze upon your endymion who sleeps under the open sky like the hunter he is and that at times you even come down to him from the middle of your journey ask your son my dear aphrodite who is the cause of this conduct of mine don't speak of him he's an insolent rogue myself in fact his own mother how has he treated me one while bringing me down to ida for the sake of anchises the trojan another time to the libanus to meet that assyrian youth whom he has made an object of desire even to persephone and thus has deprived me for half the time of my beloved so that i have often threatened unless he stops such goings-on to break his bow and quiver and to clip his wings and before now i have whipped him with my sandal but somehow or other though he is frightened for the moment and begs pardon he very soon afterwards forgets all his promises but tell me is endymion handsome for in that case the evil admits of easy consolation to me he seems to be excessively handsome my dear aphrodite and most especially when he throws his cloak down under him upon the rock and goes to sleep grasping in his left hand his javelins which are just slipping from his fingers while his right arm bent double upwards round his head sets off his face in a circular frame while his limbs relaxed in sleep he breathes forth that ambrosial and divine breath of his then i confess it 
descending noiselessly and advancing on tiptoe, that he may not awake and be alarmed. You know the rest. Why should I tell you the sequel? However, I am dying for love of him. End of Dialogue 11《Dialogue 12 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Dialogue 12. Aphrodite upbraids Eros for his mischievous conduct in the past, and cautions him for the future. Eros defends himself. Eros, read by Thomas Peter. Aphrodite, read by Sandra. Eros, my child, just consider your conduct. I don't mean on earth, what deeds you induce men to do against themselves, or one against the other, but even in heaven, you, who show up mighty Zeus himself in a variety of shapes, converting him into whatever you please, at the moment, and drag Selene down from heaven, and force Helios, forgetting all about his charioteering, sometimes to loiter on his way with his Clemene, while in regard to your wanton conduct to me, you act with entire freedom. Nay, most audacious boy, you have induced even Rhea herself, who long ago was an old woman, and the mother of such a number of gods, to fall in love with boys, and to indulge a passion for the Phrygian youth. And now she has lost her senses by your work, and harnessed lions, and taken to her the Corybantes, who are like mad people themselves, and they tramp up and down about Ida, she making dismal lamentations for Ettes, while as for the Corybantes, one gashes his arm with a knife, another letting down his hair, rushes like a madman through the mountains, one blows on the horn, another beats an accompaniment on the drum, or raises a horrible din on the cymbal, and in fine, all Ida is in tumult and frenzy. I fear therefore everything. I, who brought you into the world to be such a plague, am dreadfully afraid that Rhea, in one of her mad fits, or indeed rather still in her senses, may order her corybantes to seize you and tear you in pieces, or cast you to her lions. Such is my dread, when I see you running such risks. Never fear, mother for i have been a long time on the best of terms even with the lions themselves and frequently i mount on their backs and laying hold of their manes i drive them as if they had reins and they fawn on me and taking my hand in their mouths after licking it all over give it back to me why as for rhea herself when could she have leisure to do any harm to me wholly taken up as she is with eighties and besides what wrong do i do in pointing out beautiful objects such as they are and as for you others do you not yourselves long after beautiful things then don't accuse me of these offences and do you yourself mother really wish no longer to love ares or him you what a dreadful boy you are and how you tyrannize over all well you will recall my words some time or other End of Dialogue 12《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディアローグ13》《ディア
is it pray because zeus knocked you on the head with his bolt for your unlawful actions because now out of mere pity by way of compensation you have got a share of immortality what have you for your part heracles altogether forgotten your having been burned to ashes on mount ota that you throw in my teeth this fire you talk of we have not lived at all an equal or similar sort of life i who am the son of zeus and have undergone so many and great labors purifying human life contending against and conquering wild beasts and punishing insolent and injurious men whereas you are a paltry herb doctor and mountebank skilful possibly in palming off your miserable drugs upon sick fools but who have never given proof of any noble manly disposition you say well seeing i healed your burns when you came up but now half burned with your body all marred and destroyed by the double cause of your death the poisoned shirt and afterwards the fire now i if i have done nothing else at least have neither worked like a slave as you have nor have i carded wool in lydia dressed in a fine purple gown nor have i been beaten by that omphil of yours with her golden slipper no nor did i in a mad fit kill my children and my wife if you don't stop at once your ribald abuse of me you shall very speedily learn your immortality will not much avail you for i will take and pitch you head first out of heaven so that not even the wonderful paean himself shall cure you in your broken skull have done i say and don't disturb the harmony of the company or i will pack both of you off from the supper-room although to speak the truth heracles it is fair and reasonable asclepius should have precedence of you at table inasmuch as he even took precedence of you in death end of dialogue thirteen dialogue fourteen of the dialogues of the gods by lucian translated by howard williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dialogue fourteen apollo recounts to hermes the manner of the death of hyacinthus and his grief for the same hermes read by stephan apollo read by aaron white why so gloomy and dejected my dear apollo because hermes i am unhappy in my love affairs such misfortune is indeed worthy occasion for grief but in what affair is it you are unfortunate does that business of daphne still affect you not at all no i mourn for my favourite the laconian the son of abelus what tell me is hyacinthus dead too surely by whose hands my dear apollo could there be any one so unloving as to kill that handsome youth it was my own doing were you then out of your senses apollo no but it was a species of ill luck an involuntary deed how for i am anxious to hear the manner of it he was learning to play with a quoit and i was playing with him well that most cursed of winds sapphirus himself was in love with him from a long time past and being neglected and not able to endure his superciliousness while i threw my quoit up into the air as we are accustomed to do blowing down from tegetus bore the disc along and caused it to fall on the head of the youth so that the blood flowed from the wound in large quantity and the boy died immediately 
however i at once avenged myself on zephyrus by shooting at him with my arrows pursuing him in his flight as far as the mountain and to the boy i had a tomb raised at amicale where the quoit struck him down and from his blood i caused the ground to send up a flower the sweetest hermes and the gayest coloured of all flowers having moreover letters mourning for the dead imprinted on it do i appear to you to have been grieved unreasonably yes my dear apollo for you knew that you had made a mere mortal the object of your particular affection so pray don't vex yourself about his death End of Dialogue 14Dialogue 15 of The Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian Translated by Howard Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 15 Hermes and Apollo envy the deformed Hephaestus the possession of his beautiful wives. Hermes, read by Stephan. Apollo, read by Aaron White. But the fact, Apollo, that though he is both lame and a mere brazier by trade, he has married the most beautiful wives of us all, Aphrodite and Charis. A mere piece of good luck, my dear Hermes. But this I do wonder at, that they tolerate having anything to do with him most especially when they see him running down with perspiration as he stoops laboriously over his furnace, and with a quantity of soot upon his face. And yet, though he is such a figure, they embrace him, and kiss him, and sleep with him. This, too, I feel indignant about, and envy Hephaestus, whereas you wear long flowing hair and play on the cephora and pride yourself greatly on your good looks and i upon my vigour and good habit of body and my lyre straightway when we have to go to bed we shall sleep all alone besides too as far as i am concerned i have no fortune in my fair de cour and two at all events whom i especially loved daphne and hyacinthus well daphne hated me to such a degree that she chose to become a tree rather than have my embraces while hyacinthus i killed with that quoit and now in place of them i have to be content with garlands and as for me, Aphrodite I, some time since, but one must not brag. I know, and she is said to have presented you with Hermaphroditus. But tell me this, if you know it all, how is Aphrodite not jealous of Ceres, or Ceres jealous of her? Because, my dear Apollo, the former lives with him in Lemnos, and aphrodite and heaven and besides the latter is for the most part taken up with ares and is in love with him so that she cares little for this brazier fellow and do you suppose that hephaestus knows this he knows well enough but what could he do when he sees a fine youth and that too a soldier so he keeps quiet however he threatens at all events that he will devise some kind of fetters for them and catch them together by throwing a net over their bed 
I don't know, but I would devoutly pray that I myself might be the one to be caught in her company. End of Dialogue 15「and Sonia S. Leto. Fine creatures indeed are the children you have presented to Zeus, Leto. It's not all of us, Hera, who can produce such progeny as your Hephaestus. But this same cripple is at all events of some use. He is an excellent workman, and has decorated heaven for us in a thoroughly artistic fashion, and he married Aphrodite, and is made much of by her while well, as for your children one of them is beyond all measure masculine and mountainish and to crown all has made off to scythia and every one knows what her diet is there slaying strangers and imitating the scythians themselves who are cannibals as for apollo he makes pretence to universal knowledge to shoot with the bow to play the katara to be a doctor and to prophesy and having set up his oracle shops one at delphi another at claros and at didyma he juggles and cheats those who consult him giving crooked answers and double meanings applicable to either side of the question so that he runs no risk of failure and from such trickery he makes his fortune for numerous are the fools and those who offer themselves willing victims to be cheated and imposed upon. But by the wiser part of men it is not unknown that he is, for the most part, a mere juggler in words. The prophet himself, at all events, did not know he would kill his favourite with the quoit, nor did he divine for his own advantage that Daphne would flee from him and that too although he is so handsome and has such flowing locks so i don't see why you thought you had finer children than poor niobe these same children however the murderer of strangers and the lying prophet i am well aware how it vexes you to see them in the company of the gods and especially whenever the one is commended for her beauty and the other performs on his chitera to the admiration of all in the banqueting hall <laughs> oh i could not help laughing leto he an object of admiration whom if the muses had chosen to give a just decision marcius would have flayed as himself the conqueror in the musical contest but as it was the poor man was overreached and perished by an unjust doom and as for your beautiful virgin she is so beautiful that when she found she had been seen by actaeon from fear the youth might proclaim her ugliness she set on him with his own dogs i don't say all i might for i omit to dwell on the fact that if she were really a virgin she could not even assist ladies in the straw <laughs> you bear yourself superciliously hera because you share the bed and throne of zeus and for that reason you utter your insults without fear but however i shall soon see you in tears again when he deserts you and goes down to earth again in the form of a bull or a swan End of dialogue 16. Dialogue 17 of the dialogues of the gods by lucian translated by howard williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 17 Hermes narrates to Apollo the adultery of Ares and Aphrodite, and the revenge of Hephaestus. Hermes, read by Stephan. Apollo, read by Aaron White. Why do you laugh, Hermes? Because, my dear Apollo, I have seen the most ridiculous sight possible. Then tell me that I myself, too, when I have heard, may be able to join in the laugh. Aphrodite has been caught with Ares, and Hephaestus has captured and bound them. How? For I fancy you are going to tell me something pleasant. For a long time I imagine he had been aware of this amour, and was hunting them down. And when he had enveloped their bed with invisible feathers, he went back to his forge and worked away as usual. Then Ares enters unobserved, as he supposed, but Helios looks down upon them and sees them and tells Hephaestus. And when they had got upon the bed and were in each other's arms, and were involved within the meshes. The feathers completely entangle them, and Hephaestus suddenly comes upon them. She, you may be sure, had no means, for in fact she was entirely naked, of veiling her shame, while Ares at first kept making efforts to escape, and hoped to break the bonds but afterwards perceiving himself to be inextricably caught he began to act the suppliant what then did hephaestus release them not at all on the contrary summoning all the gods he discovers to them their adultery while the captives bound together naked with eyes fixed on the ground show their confusion by their blushes and the spectacle appeared to me the pleasantest imaginable all but as good as the antecedent event itself but the blacksmith does he not himself too feel shame in exposing the disgrace of his marriage bed no by heaven not he who in fact stands over them and laughs at them for myself, however, if one must speak the truth, I did grudge Ares not only his intrigue with the fairest of the goddesses, but even his being bound with her. Then would you really endure even to be fettered upon that condition? And would you not, my dear Apollo, only come and have a look? For I will commend you, if you would not yourself, too, pray for the like good fortune, if you did but see. End of Dialogue 17「Dialogue 18 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 18 Hera denounces, and Zeus defends, the character of Bacchus. Hera and Zeus Hera read by phone Zeus read by Kevin S. I should be ashamed, Zeus, if I had such an effeminate son, and so debauched a drunkard, with his hair bound with the women's headband, associating chiefly with frantic women, more effeminate than themselves, dancing to the noise of drums and pipe and cymbals, and in short, like anything rather than his father. 
yet this effeminate mitre wearer who goes more delicately than women hera not only conquered lydia and took captive the inhabitants of timulus and brought the thracians under his yoke but also made an expedition against the indians with an army of women took possession of the elephants and made himself master of the country and led away captive the king who dared to offer him a brief resistance and all this he did while leaping about and dancing with his chorus bearing the ivy wreathed thyrsus drunk as you say in bacchanalian frenzy but if any one attempts to insult him by showing contempt for the initiation into his mystic rites he certainly avenges himself on him either by binding him with vine twigs or by causing him to be torn in pieces by his mother like a fawn do you observe how manly these actions are and not unworthy of his father and if playful sportiveness and wantonness are combined with them there is no cause for begrudging them to him and especially if one considers what he would be sober when he performs such actions drunk you appear to me to be going to commend also his discovery divine and wine and that though you see how drunkards behave staggering along and betaking themselves to insolence and violence and in a word maddened under the influence of the drink as for icarius at all events to whom he first gave divine shoot his boon companions themselves destroyed him by striking him with their spades that is nothing to the purpose for it's not the wine nor dionysus that does this but immoderateness in drinking and filling oneself with unmixed wine beyond what is becoming but a man who should drink within the bounds of moderation will be a more jovial and genial disposition and as to the fate of icarus dionysus could not have designed any harm to any of his boon companions but you seem to me to be still jealous hera and to remember semele since you calumniate the finest and fairest gifts of dionysus end of dialogue eighteen dialogue nineteen of the dialogues of the gods by lucian translated by howard williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dialogue nineteen eros explains to his mother why he does not assail athena the muse and artemis eros read by thomas peter aphrodite read by sandra pray why in the world my dear eros have you completely subdued to yourself all the rest of the gods zeus poseidon apollo rhea me your mother and kept your hands off athena alone and why as far as she's concerned is your torch without a spark your quiver empty of arrows and yourself without a bow and without practice i am afraid of her mother for she is terrible and her eyes burn with a fierce brightness and she is dreadfully masculine at all events whenever i advance towards her with bent bow she shakes her crest at me and frightens me out of my wits and i am all of a tremble and my arrows slip from my hands why was not Ares more alarming and yet you disarmed him in a moment and have conquered him yes but he readily allows me to approach him and invites me of his own accord while athena is always watching me suspiciously and secretly and once i flew by her casually with my torch and said she if you come near me by my father i will run you through in a moment with my pretty spear or i will seize you by the foot and pitch you into tartarus or tear you in pieces with my own hand and be the death of you many such threats as she uttered and she puts on sour looks and has on her breast a frightful sort of face with snakes all over for hair which is my especial horror for it frightens me like a very mormo and i flee whenever i catch a glimpse of it but you fear athena as you say and the gorgon 
and that though you are not afraid of the thunderbolt of zeus and the muses why are they unwounded and out of reach of your darts do they too shake crests and exhibit gorgons in front of them i have an awe of them mother for they are grave and respectable and are always in some profound meditation or other and are occupied in song and i often stand by them beguiled by their melody well leave them out of the question too as they are grave and respectable but artemis why don't you inflict a wound on her in a word it is impossible even to come up with her as she is always fleeing through the mountains then too she has already her own peculiar kind of love for what child the hunting of stags and fawns pursuing them for the purpose of capturing them or shooting them down and she is entirely devoted to that sort of thing when however her brother although an archer himself and a far shooter i know child you have shot your arrow at him often enough end of dialogue nineteen dialogue twenty of the dialogues of the gods by lucian translated by howard williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dialogue twenty the judgment of paris zeus hermes hera athena aphrodite paris or alexander Stage Directions, read by Todd. Paris, read by Aaron White. Aphrodite, read by Sandra. Sonia S. Athena. Hera, read by Phone. Hermes, read by Owen Cook. Zeus, read by Alan Mapstone. Take this apple here, Hermes and high to phrygia to the presence of the son of priam the cowherd he is tending his cows on the gargarus summit of ida and say to him paris zeus bids you since you are yourself a good-looking youth and clever in love matters to decide for the goddesses here which is the most beautiful and let the winner receive the apple as the prize of the contest and now goddesses it is quite time for yourselves to set off to the presence of your judge for for my part i decline for myself the office of arbitrator loving you as i do with equal affection and if it were only possible i would with pleasure see you all three winners especially i do decline as in giving the prize of beauty to one i must certainly incur the hatred of the rest for this reason i am myself no suitable umpire for you but this phrygian youth to whom you are going is of princely birth and is a relative of ganymede here in other respects he is simple and mountain bred no one would think him unworthy of such a spectacle as far as i am concerned zeus even though you should appoint momus himself our judge i will cheerfully go to the exhibition for indeed what could he have to find fault with me the man however will have to satisfy these goddesses too oh it's not we aphrodite who have to fear no not though your own ares should be entrusted with the arbitration may we also accept this paris whoever he may be and does this content you daughter too what say you you turn away and blush is it the privilege of virgins indeed to be shy about such matters but you nod assent however away with you all then and see that you are not hard upon your judge you who have been vanquished and don't have any mischief inflicted on the youth for it's not possible 
for you all to be equally beauties let us start off straight for phrygia i leading the way and do you follow me without loitering and keep up your spirits i am personally acquainted with paris he is a good-looking youth and amorous into the bargain and very competent to judge in all such matters he would not give a bad judgment that is all fair and you speak quite after my mind that he is the right judge for us confidentially but is he a bachelor or has he some wife or other living with him not absolutely a bachelor aphrodite how do you mean some lady of ida appears to be keeping company with him well enough in her way but countrified and dreadfully boorish however he does not seem to be excessively attached to her but pray why do you put these questions i asked quite indifferently hollo you sir there you are exceeding your commission in communicating with her in private there was nothing extraordinary athena and nothing against you she only asked me if paris is a bachelor and pray why is she so inquisitive about that i don't know but she says it occurred to her quite casually and she had no purpose in asking well is he unmarried i think not what then has he a desire for the military life and is he at all ambitious for glory or is he altogether devoted to his herds the exact truth i am unable to say but one must suppose that a young fellow like him would be eager to acquire fame in these things and would like to be first in fighting aphrodite pouting do you see i don't find fault nor charge you with talking to her on the sly for such sort of querulousness is peculiar to people not over much pleased with themselves it's not aphrodite's way indeed she asked me almost exactly the same question as she did you so don't be a pet and don't imagine you are worse treated if i answered her somewhat frankly and simply but while we are talking we have already advanced far on our road and taken leave of the stars and in fact are almost opposite phrygia and now in fact i see ida and the whole of gargarus distinctly and if i am not deceived paris himself your umpire but where is he for he is not visible to my eyes look carefully there to the left hera not near the top of the mountain but along the flank where the cave is there where you see the herd but i don't see the herd oh do you not see tiny cows in the direction of my finger so advancing from the midst of the rocks and someone running down from the cliff with a shepherd's crook and stopping them from scattering ahead now i see if it really is he but it is and since we are now so near let us if you please settle down on terra firma and walk that we may not quite disconcert him by flying down all on a sudden from the clouds you are right so let us do and now we have made our own descent it is high time for you aphrodite to advance and show us the way for you as is reasonable to expect are well acquainted with the locality having frequently as report goes come down here to anchises these sneers of yours hera don't disturb me over much well i will act as your guide and chaperone for i myself in fact passed some time on ida when zeus to be sure was in love with the phrygian boy and often have i come here when sent down to look after the child and when at length he was mounted on the eagle i flew by his side with him and helped to support my handsome charge and if i recollect aright from this rock here he snatched him up for the boy happened to be piping to his flock at the moment and flying down himself from behind zeus very lightly embraced him in his talons and grasping his turban with his beak bore the lad aloft in a terrible state of alarm as he was gazing on his ravisher with neck bent backwards then picking up his shepherd's pipe for he had let it fall in his fright i but excuse me for here is our umpire close at hand so let us accost him good day to you herdsman the same to you young man but who are you 
and what is the purpose of your visit to us? What ladies are these you are conducting? For such town bells as they are, they are not fitted for roving over rough mountains. But they are not women, Paris, but it is Hera and Athena and Aphrodite, you see. And I, I am the god Hermes, Zeus has sent with them. But why do you tremble and turn so pale? Don't be frightened, for there is nothing to be afraid of. He only bids you to be the judge of their beauty. For since, says he, you are a beautiful youth yourself, and clever in love matters, I entrust the judgment to you, and when you have read the inscription on the apple, you will know the prize of the contest. Ha! Oh, come, let me see what it all means. Let the beautiful one take me, it says. How, pray, Sir Hermes, could I, a mere mortal myself, and a simple peasant too, be a judge of so preternaturally wonderful a spectacle, and one too great for a poor herdsman to decide upon? To judge in matters of such importance is rather for delicately nurtured persons and courtiers, but for my part, whether one she-goat be more beautiful than another she-goat, or one heifer surpasses another heifer in beauty, I could perhaps decide secundum artem, but these ladies are all equally beautiful, and I don't know how a man could wrench away his gaze and transfer it from the one to the other, for it will not easily unfix itself. But where it first rests, to that part it clings, and commends what's immediately before it. And even though it pass on to another part, that too it sees to be beautiful, and lingers, and is caught by the adjoining charms, and in short their beauty has circumfused itself about me, and wholly taken possession of me. And I am vexed that I, too, cannot, like Argus, see with all my body. I think I should judge fairly if I give the apple to all, for, indeed, there is this difficulty besides. It happens that this lady is the sister and wife of Zeus, and that these are his daughters. How, I should like to know, is not the decision a hard one from this point of view, too? I don't know about that, but it's not possible to shirk the commands of Zeus, I know. This one thing, Hermes, persuade them to, that the two defeated ladies be not angry with me, but consider the error to attach to my eyes alone. Hermes confers with the goddesses apart. They promise to comply with your request, and now it is high time for you to proceed with your judgment. I will do my best endeavors, for how can one help it? But this first I wish to know. Will it be quite enough to view them as they are, or will it be necessary to make them undress for an accurate examination? That must be your part as judge to decide. Give your orders how and in what way you like. How I like, really. Uh, I wish to see them undressed. Oh, you ladies there, off with your clothes. To Paris. For your part, make a thorough survey. As for me, I avert my face at once. Very well said, Paris, and I will be the first to undress, that you may perceive that I have not only white arms, and that I am not proud of having cow's eyes only, but that I am equally and proportionally beautiful all over. Ah, off with your clothes too, Aphrodite. Don't let her undress Paris before she lays aside her cestus, for she is an enchantress, for fear she may bewitch you by its means. Indeed, she ought not either to have appeared here so meretriciously tricked out, nor painted up with so many dyes and cosmetics 
for all the world as if she were in fact some lady of the demi-monde but have exhibited her beauty unadorned paris turning to aphrodite they are quite right as to that cestus of yours so you must end off it why then do you not also athena doff that helmet of yours and display your bare head instead of shaking that plumed crest and terrifying your judge are you afraid that fiercely glaring look about your eyes seen without that frightful object may be set down to your discredit there i have taken off this objectionable helmet for your satisfaction there too is the cestus for yours well let us undress paris expressing in his features the utmost admiration oh oh zeus worker of miracles glorious vision the beauty the delight oh how superb is the virgin goddess and how right royally and with what dignity does this goddess hera shine in all her splendour and how truly right worthy of zeus but how sweetly does this goddess here aphrodite look and what a kind of pretty seducing smile she has well now i have enough of this felicity but if it is agreeable i wish to have a look at each of them separately in private as at present i am really in doubt and don't know on what part to fix my gaze for my eyes are distracted in every direction let us do as he wishes withdraw then you too and do you hera remain i will do so and after you have had a good look at me it will be time for you to consider other matters besides whether the gifts at my disposal in return for your vote do not appear fair to you for if my dear paris you award me the prize of beauty you shall be lord of all asia our decision depends not on bribes now withdraw please for whatever seems proper will have to be done hereafter and now athena do you approach here i am at your service and in my turn paris if you award to me the prize of beauty you shall never come out of battle worsted but always victorious for i will make a warrior and a conqueror of you I, I don't want war and fighting athena for peace as you see at present prevails both in phrygia and in lydia and my father's kingdom is free from war but never mind for you shall not be the worse for it even though we do not give judgment for bribes well now put on your clothes again and replace the helmet on your head for i have seen enough it is now time for aphrodite to appear here i am at your elbow and examine carefully each part of me one by one passing over nothing but dwelling upon every one of my charms and if you will my handsome youth listen to this from me i have reason to ask you to do so for i have long ago observed you to be young and good-looking of such sort that i doubt if all phrygia supports another like you and i congratulate you on your good looks but i blame you that you do not leave these lonely cliffs and these rocks and go and live in the city instead of wasting your sweetness on the desert air for what enjoyment can such as you obtain from the mountains and what satisfaction can your cows derive from your handsome face you ought by this time to have married not however some hoydenish and rustic girl such as are the women of ida but some girl out of hellas from argos or from corinth or a spartan lady such as helen young and beautiful and in no way inferior to myself and what is indeed most to the point of an amorous disposition 
for i tell you if she were but only to see you she would i am sure leave all and give herself up soul and body to you and would follow your fortunes and live with you but surely even you have heard something of her fame not a word aphrodite and i should now be glad to hear from you a full account of her she's the daughter of leda the famous beauty to whom zeus flew down in the shape of a swan what is she like to look at pale and fair as the daughter of a swan might be expected to be and delicate like one bred in an egg trained naked for the most part in the gymnasium and skilled in the art of wrestling and she has been in a manner so much indeed in request that there has even been a war on her account theseus having run away with her when not yet in her teens not indeed but that since she arrived at her majority all the greatest princes of the archaeans met together to woo her and menelaus of the family of the pelopidae was preferred if you wish it i say i will bring about the nuptials for you what with a girl already married you are young and countrified i know however how affairs of this sort are to be managed how for i should like to know too myself you will set out on your travels as if with the purpose of seeing hellas and as soon as ever you arrive at lacedaemon helen shall see you and from that moment it will be my business that she shall fall in love and run away with you that's the very thing that seems to me hard to believe that she should leave her husband and be ready to sail off with a foreigner and a stranger as far as that's concerned have no fear for i have two handsome boys desire and love them i will give you to be guides of the way and love stealthily assailing her with all his might will compel the lady to fall in love while desire shedding his whole influence over yourself will render you what he is himself an object of desire and of love and i will be present in person to assist them i will request of the graces also to attend you so that all of us together may persuade her how it will all turn out is not clear aphrodite but i am already in love with this helen and i fancy i don't know how i even see her and am on my voyage straight for hellas and am staying at sparta yes and am now returning home with my wife and i feel vexed i am not already engaged about all this don't fall in love paris before you have rewarded your matchmaker and the bridesmaid with your favourable sentence for it would be proper for me too to be with you as the bringer of victory and at once to celebrate your marriage and to sing your triumphal odes for it is in your own power to purchase everything love beauty marriage with this apple here i am afraid that after the verdict you may forget me would you have me then give you my oath upon it not at all but just promise me once again i promise you i say to give over to you helen for your wife and that she shall run away with you and shall come to ilium to you i myself will certainly be present and will assist you in everything and you will bring love and desire and the graces be sure of it and i will take with me passionate longing and hymen besides on these conditions then i give the apple to you on these conditions receive it end of dialogue twenty Dialogue 21 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian. Translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 21 
Ares ridicules the threat of Zeus and the chain let down from heaven. Ares and Hermes. Hermes, read by Owen Cook. Ares, read by phone. Did you hear, Hermes, what threats Zeus uttered against us? How arrogant and absurd! If I should have a mind to it, says he, I will let down a chain from heaven, and you shall hang on it, and use all your force to pull me down, but you will labor in vain, for you will certainly not drag me down. Whereas should I wish to drag it up, not only you, but both the earth and sea, I will fasten together and suspend in mid-air. And all the other menaces, which surely you have heard. Now I, for my part, would not deny that he is superior to and stronger than any of us taken separately, but that he surpasses so many of us together, so that we could not wear him out, even though we brought to our aid earth and sea, that I could not believe. Fair speech, my dear Ares, for it's not safe to speak in this sort of way, for fear we reap some mischief from your idle talk. Why, do you suppose that I should say this to everyone, and not to you alone, who, I knew, can hold your tongue? But what, however, seemed to me especially ridiculous, as I listened while he was threatening, I could not possibly be silent about to you. Why, I remember, no very long time before, when Poseidon and Hera and Athena rose up, and conspired to seize him and put him in fetters how he resorted to all sorts of devices in his terror and that though they were only three against him and if thetis in fact out of pity had not summoned to his aid briareus of the hundred hands he would have been bound hand and foot his thunderbolt and all as I thought of this, it constrained me to laugh at his fine grandiloquence. Hold your tongue, I say, for it is not safe either for you to talk or for me to hear this sort of language. End of Dialogue 21Translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 22 Pan urges his claims to be the son of Hermes who is unwilling to admit his paternity. Hermes, read by Stephan. Pan, read by Aaron White. How do you do, my father, Hermes? And how are you? But how am I your father? Are you not, perchance, the Kylenian Hermes? Certainly. How, then... Are you my son? I am the result of an irregular intrigue. Your love, child. By heaven, rather, probably, of an intrigue of goats. For how could you be mine, with your horns, and such a snub nose, and shaggy beard, and cloven feet, and goatish legs, and tail upon your rump. Whatever sneers you aim at me, it is your own son. You render an object of reproach, my dear father, but yourself still more for begetting and making such offspring. I am innocent of it all. And whom do you call your mother? Have I perchance had an intrigue with a goat without knowing it? You have not committed adultery with a goat. But recollect yourself, if you have never offered violence, 
to a girl of gentle birth in Arcadia. Why do you bite your thumb to find an answer and remain in doubt so long? I allude to Penelope, the daughter of Icarius. Then under what circumstances did she bring you into the world, resembling a goat instead of myself? I will give you her very own story. Well, when she dispatched me to Arcadia, my child, said she, I am your mother, Penelope, of Sparta, and know you have a god, Hermes, the son of Maia and Zeus for your father, and if you wear horns and have the legs of a goat, let not that circumstance distress you, for when your father visited me, he gave himself the form of a he-goat, to avoid notice, and for that reason you have turned out very like that animal. In truth, I remember to have done something of the kind. Shall I, however, who pride myself so greatly on my good looks, and am still without a beard, have the reputation of being your father, and incur ridicule at the hands of all on account of my lovely offspring? Yet shall I not disgrace you, father, for I am a musician, and play the pipe with remarkable sweetness, and Bacchus can do nothing without me, but has made me his companion and thyrsus bearer for himself and I lead the dance for him. And if you could see my flocks too, what a large number I possess in the neighborhood of Tegea, and all over Parthenius, you would be greatly delighted. And I rule over all Arcadia. And, but lately, having fought on the side of the Athenians, I distinguished myself so much at Marathon, that even a prize of valour was awarded me, the cave under the Acropolis. In fact, if you go to Athens, you will know how great is the name of Pan there. But tell me, have you already married Pan? For that, I believe, is what they call you. Certainly not, father for I am of an amorous turn, and could never be content to live with one wife. Then, no doubt, you make love to your she-goats. You are indulging in sarcasm. I keep company with Echo, and with Pities, and with all the menads of Bacchus, and am made much of by them. Do you know, however, how you could gratify me, my dear son, who ask a favor of you for the first time? Lay your commands upon me, father, and let us know them. Come to me, then, and affectionately embrace me. But see that you don't call me father at least in the hearing of anybody else. End of Dialogue 22。Dialogue number 23 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue number 23. Apollo remarks to Bacchus on the heterogeneousness of Aphrodite's children, while Bacchus exposes the character of Priapus. Dionysus, read by Todd. Apollo, read by T.J. Burns. What should we say? That Eros, Hermaphroditus, and Priapus are brothers by the same mother? very unlike though they are in external form and in their pursuits for the one is altogether handsome and an archer and invested with no small amount of power rules over all while the second is womanish and only half a man and of ambiguous appearance 
you could not plainly distinguish whether he is a young man or a virgin. As for the third, he is masculine beyond the bounds of all decency. Priapus, I mean. There is nothing to be surprised at, Apollo. For Aphrodite is not the cause of it, but the different fathers. Often, in fact, where the children are by the same father, of the same mother, they are, like yourselves, the one a male, the other a female. Yes, but we are alike, and follow the same pursuits, for we are archers, both of us. As far as the bow is concerned, your occupation is the same, Apollo. But those other things are not exactly similar. That Artemis murders strangers among the Scythians, and you act the prophet, and set up for a doctor. Why, do you imagine that my sister is happy with the Scythians? Seeing she is quite prepared, if any Greek should ever happen to touch the Tauric Peninsula, to sail away with him, loathing her sacrificial butchery. And she does well to do so. As for Priapus, however, for I will tell you something highly ridiculous, being lately at Lampsacus, I was travelling by the city, and he received me hospitably, and gave me lodgings in his house. When we had retired to rest, after having sufficiently moistened ourselves at the dinner, somewhere about midnight my excellent host got up. But I blush to tell you. Did he make any attempt on your virtue, Dionysus? Something of the sort. And you? What did you do thereupon? Why, what else but laugh? <laughs> well done. <laughs> That was acted in no unkind or uncivil manner. <laughs> he was to be excused, indeed, considering his attempt was directed against so good-looking a personage as yourself. For that same reason, my dear Apollo, he might direct his attention to you, too. For you are a good-looking youth, and adorned with long flowing tresses, so that Priapus might well attempt your virtue, even in his sober moments. <laughs> He will not do so, however, Dionysus, for with my flowing hair, I have my bows and arrows also. End of Dialogue 23。Dialogue 24 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian, translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 24 Hermes complains to his mother of the multiplicity of his employments. Hermes Read by Stefan. Maya. Read by Lian Yao. Why, mother, is any god in heaven more thoroughly wretched than I? Pray, don't talk in that way, my dear Hermes. Why should not I talk so, who have such a number of duties to attend to, toiling as I do all alone? and distracted to so many services for as soon as i am up at daybreak i have to sweep out our banqueting hall and after carefully arranging the couches and putting each particular thing in order i have to take my place at the side of zeus and carry about in all directions the messages i receive from him running up and down the whole day like a courier and as soon as i have returned up here again while still covered with dust i must hand him the ambrosia before too this lately purchased cup-bearer arrived it was my business to pour in the nectar also but what is most dreadful of all is that I alone of all the gods get no sleep even at night. But I must needs, 
also be then conducting souls to pluto and acting as marshal of dead men and dance attendance in his court of justice for my employments by they are not enough to take my place in the palestra and even to act as herald in the representative assemblies and to train orators but parcelled out as i am already for all these services i must also take part in the affairs of the dead and yet the sons of leda take their places each in turn every other day in heaven and in hades but i must perforce be about my duties here and there the sons of alcamina and semele too born of wretched women though they be feast without care whereas i the son of maya the daughter of atlas wait upon them and now having but just come from sidon from the daughter of cadmus to whom he has sent me to see what the girl is about and before even i have had time to get my breath he packs me off again to argus to look after danny then go from thence says he into boeotia and have a look at antiope by the way in truth i am quite done up and give in if i could i vow i would gladly claim my right to be sold like those slaves on the earth who are vilely treated don't mind these things child for you must perforce be submissive to your father in everything since you are but a youth and now as you have been dispatched march off to argus then to boeotia that you may not get a beating for your dilatoriness for people in love are apt to have short tempers End of Dialogue 24Dialogue 25 of the Dialogues of the Gods by Lucian. Translated by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 25. Helios, accused by Zeus of rash conduct in giving up his chariot to his son, obtains a conditional pardon. Zeus, read by Owen Cook. Helios, read by Elsie Selwyn. What have you done, worst of titans? You have ruined everything on the earth by trusting that chariot of yours to a foolish youth who has burned up the one half of the world by being carried too near the earth, and the other half has caused to be utterly destroyed by cold, by withdrawing heat too far from it, and in fine there is nothing whatever that has not been utterly thrown into disturbance and confusion. Indeed, if I had not perceived what had happened and hurled him down with my thunderbolt, there would have remained not even a remnant of the human species. Such an excellent driver and charioteer have you sent forth in that fine son of yours. I committed an error, Zeus, but don't be hard upon me, since I was prevailed upon by my son with his frequent entreaties. For from whence could I have at all expected that so tremendous a mischief could come about? Did you not know what extreme caution the matter needed, and that if one swerved ever so little from the road, everything was ruined? Were you ignorant, too, of the temper of the horses, and how absolutely necessary it is to hold a tight rein? For if one slackens it at all, they immediately take the bit in their mouths, just as, in fact, they ran away with him, now to the left, and after a space to the right, and sometimes in the opposite direction to their course, and upwards and downwards, in fine, where they themselves had a mind to go, while he did not know how to treat them. 
all this indeed i knew and for that reason i for a long time resisted and would not trust the driving to him but when he begged me over and over again with tears and his mother climbing me with him after mounting him on the chariot i cautioned him how he must stand firmly and how far he should allow his horses to go into the higher regions and be borne aloft then how far he must direct them downwards again and how he must have complete control of the reins and not surrender them to the fieriness of his steeds and i told him too how great was the peril if he did not keep the straight road well he mere boy that he was taking his stand upon such a tremendous fire chariot and peering down into the yawning abyss was seized with sudden terror as was to be expected while the horses when they perceived that it was not i who was mounted upon the vehicle not heeding the youthful driver swerved from their proper route and caused this terrific calamity then he letting go of the reins from sheer fright i suppose lest he should be thrown out himself clung to the front rail of the chariot but he now has received the reward of his rashness and for me zeus the consequent grief ought to be enough punishment enough punishment do you say you who have rashly risked all this <sighs> however i will grant your pardon now for this time but for the future if you transgress at all in a similar fashion or dispatch any similar substitute for yourself you shall at once know of how much more fiery virtue is my thunderbolt than your fire so now let his sisters bury him near the eridanus whereabouts he fell where he was pitched out weeping amber over him and let them become poplars out of their grief for him but do you for your part put your chariot to pieces again both its pole is broken in two and one of the wheels is completely smashed and yoking your horses drive on once more well keep in mind all these injunctions end of dialogue twenty five dialogue twenty six of the dialogues of the gods by lucien translated by howard williams this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dialogue 26 Apollo asks Hermes to point out to him of the twin Dioscuri which is Castor and which Polyduches, and takes the opportunity of criticizing their divine pretensions. Apollo, read by Aaron White Hermes, read by Owen Cook. Can you tell me, Hermes, which of these is Castor, or which is Polyduches? For I could not distinguish between them. That is Castor, who was with us yesterday, and this is Polyduches. How do you make your distinction, for they are as like as two peas? Thus, because this one Apollo has upon his face the traces of the wounds which he received from his antagonists when boxing, and especially the wounds which were inflicted on him by the Bibrician Amicus, when on the voyage with Jason, while the other shows nothing of the kind, but is untouched and unwounded in his face. Ah, you have conferred an obligation upon me by indicating the distinguishing marks, since in regard to other parts all are exactly alike the half-segment of an egg and star above on their heads a javelin in the hand and each mounted on a white horse so that i frequently addressed polyduches as castor and the latter by the name of polyduches but tell me this too why in the world do they not both live with us but by halves either of them at one moment is a dead man and at another a divinity well, they act so out of brotherly affection for since one of the sons of leda must have died and the other have been immortal alone they of their own accord divided for themselves immortality between them in this way a not altogether wise decision hermes since by this arrangement they will not even see each other what i suppose they especially desired for how can they when one is with the gods and the other with the dead but, however, just as I deal in prophecy, and as Asclepius deals in medicine, and you, excellent trainer that you are, give instruction in the art of wrestling, and as Artemis acts the midwife, and each one of the rest of us exercises some profession useful either to the gods or to men, 
what then will these good people do for us will they such strapping youths as they are enjoy the banquet without working by no means but they have assigned to them to act as deputies for poseidon and they must ride over the sea and if they anywhere perceive sailors overtaken by a storm perch themselves on the ship and protect the voyagers a good and salutary profession hermes end of dialogue twenty six end of the dialogue of the gods by lucien translated by howard williams Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads.